Um, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. And I'd like to thank Neem and Helene and Giannis and Mark Garrett uh, for inviting me here. And it's tremendous to be with quite a few of the artists in the show here as well. I'm going to actually start with a quote, and then the rest of my talk will be pretty extemporaneous, but I will start with this quote about Bosch as a pop cultural figure. Now first, I think I asked this before, but is everyone here familiar with this painting? Yes. Right? Yeah. It's pretty significant. It has this resonance, and it's had that resonance for 500 years. And uh, during the 16th and 17th century, the painting was given many titles, including The Sins of the World, The Wages of Sin, and the Spanish called it La Luxuria, meaning lust. Now, the quote, it, this is from the Axiology and Ideology of Geronimus Bosch by Paul Vanderbroek. Quote, knowledge of both elite and subaltern cultures of Bosch's environment, including literature, language, and slang of the epoch, are a condition sine qua non, sine qua non, so an essential element, for the deciphering of his universal vision. Research into the meaning of Bosch's highly elusive visual world has produced a number of studies, notable among them articles by the Ghent School, of philologists and folklorists and art historians. It was their contention that as a product of his time, Bosch could be understood only in terms of contemporary sources of urban and popular culture, vernacular. It is here that the dark and enigmatic aspect of Bosch's visual world resides. Although intended for the middle class, and then later, in the 1500s, aristocratic consumption, it drew its inspiration from a plebeian world, a world that had neither the means nor perhaps the desire to express itself in painting. Bosch thus functioned as a link between two very different cultures. In order to understand his work, we must identify the interests, values, and concerns of the urban middle class of his time in parallel with the characteristic features of popular culture from which he drew. Hence, in 2013, I began the process of emojifying a Bosch. I don't think emojify exists as a verb, but I emojified it. And if anyone has already been to the show, you, it doesn't actually exist in a cell phone. But it was important to frame it that way for this talk, to think about the context of network culture, to think about high and low. And I definitely um, kind of identify with Mark in terms of coming from working class. I came from a really small town. And so when I first moved to New York, where I live, the art world was something that was both fascinating and terrifying to me, because it was a world of elites. And someone like Andy Warhol was really important to me. He a, he's, might be a, a kind of difficult character at times, but pop art, art that, that looked high, but also was coming from vernacular, from just the middle class, from advertising. And so I really identified and found some solace in work that was able to kind of look at culture, speak about culture, and, and, and still have these aspirations to be art and redefine what art could be. And, um, and those are things I think I was thinking about when I first embarked on this. Also, there was a call for emoji art at this center in New York. Um, and so I decided I'd been working a little bit with emoji symbology. And so it was really an emoji light bulb moment. I stayed up all night and decided you know, to embark on this. And I did not think I would be taken seriously. So I put the work in iBeam Art and Technology Center. It's, it was an exhibition. And I was really surprised that people um, really were fascinated and, and it resonated with people. Okay, let me go on. Now, um, there are a couple Easter eggs in the work and uh, I had quite a bit of fun, you know, looking at the icon iconography of a 500 year old painting and realizing 
that some of these symbols could actually be translated by emoji, the, the language that we use as a shorthand for emotional expression. But it also produced a little cognitive dissonance, and I started with the hell panel, to have these smiling faces in hell. <laughs> and I also inserted this little Easter egg. Anyone recognize this text? And it's funny. Walter Benjamin, yeah. And uh, I put it in hell for all those media study and digital art students who have to read this, you know, their first semester of school. So there it is. In principle, a work of art has always been reproducible. Man-made artifacts, or human-made, could always be imitated. Replicas were made by pupils in practice of their craft, by masters for diffusing their work, and finally by third parties in the pursuit of gain. And I don't have to read this all out because I'm sure you all are probably familiar with this text by now. And um, it's interesting how someone like Bosch has been remixed and, and the work was beginning to be replicated and duplicated even during his lifetime. Very little is known actually about Bosch um, other than the uh, existing works. Um, but Salvador Dali apparently went to the Prado every day as a child. And as you can see, um, the surrealistic kind of imaginings of Dali certainly I think are rooted in the enigmatic work of Bosch. When I was in school, I actually have an MFA in painting, and so before I embarked on my work as a new media artist, I um, had painted and uh, been an oil painter for about 12 years. And uh, when I was in grad school, Salvador Dali was someone else that you, know, you could not take seriously, but it's interesting how uh, over the years he's someone who has been significant to me as well. Also, in terms of popular culture, um, one thing that really fascinated me about kind of mashing up emoji with Bosch was its resonance again. I have also had this kind of side project where I um, document results from Google searches, from Google search strings, and both Bosch and emoji had similar kind of metrics on Google in terms of their popularity. So a 500-year-old work still resonated with people. People, you know, make body art out of uh, different characters and chimera from Bosch, these strange characters that still art historians as well as just uh, a high school student are scratching their heads about the meanings of. Now, one other thing um, about my process in general, I studied piano for about 12 years, and so transposing things in di different keys and for different instruments was always really interesting to me when I was uh, in high school. And later, as I started working with emerging technologies, that's something that also has kind of carried through. And this idea of starting with an idea, a kernel of an idea, a lot of times my work is about remix or remixing, and uh, then uh, translating it across media channels. So you have this core idea, but today the way we consume information is through various channels, and so why would I not make work across these different channels? So there are drawings that's the, that exist. There's the actual physical print, which is very, um, uh, I, I kind of kept it very similar to the original source, which is the Garden of Earthly Delights. There are 3D prints, there are animated GIFs, and then there's a, a 4K video. Now there are a series of about 14 vignettes. Let's see if this plays. It would be fun for this play, yes. And this is one of my favorites. This is called Shrimp Mermaid Goddess. So again, in the original print that I made, it's very faithful to the original uh, work, but then when I embarked on making these animated GIFs and vignettes, their details, and we get a golden shower that predates Trump. Uh, this is another 3D print, and um, historians, some claim that this is actually the tree-legged egg-shaped man is a self-portrait of Bosch and very Frankenstein-like, I'd say. And um, I actually collaborated with another artist, Everett Kane, in New York, and we produced this new chimera. It's called Escape Pod, and you can escape through the ass of this creature, basically. Um, what I already mentioned was, you know, when I first stayed up all night and decided that I was going to emojify something, um, I thought no one would take me seriously. And the first time I showed the work, I, I got quite a few 
positive responses. And after I completed the entire three panels, um, there was more response. And, and actually, the work went viral online. And so I was invited to participate in Internet Yami Ichi. Has anybody heard of that? So it started in Japan, and there was one in New York a few years ago that I was invited to. So programmers, artists, designers from around New York City and Queens and various boroughs were invited to bring to um, participate and include work that had an uh, inspiration from internet culture, but that was offered at a very low price point. And so I decided to remix myself. And I was really thinking about authorship at the time. Um, quite a bit of my work, I, again, I, I mentioned that you know, I, I do a lot of remix and mashups. And a lot of times, it's from the canon. It's male artist. And, um, and someone, a troll online, had already made some snarky comment about that my work was, you know, it was Bosch and emoji that people were interested in. So I really decided to kind of unpack that. And because the work had been you know, taken on a life of its own on Instagram and various other social media platforms, I decided to take the various images other people had posted of the work, and based on the number of likes their image got, that was the pixel resolution of the work. And each one was one of a kind, so scarcity model at a very low price point. Now this famous art critic in New York, um, Jerry Saltz is his name, had taken a photo of the work. And these all had to be stipulation, was it was all of the physical piece. And his got 1,976 likes. I had people fighting to buy that work. And it really speaks to um, how we equate worth in art today, right? Was, and, and I was kind of, this was kind of cultural anthropology. It was like, well, is it because I made that work? Is it because Bosch resonates? Or is it because it's Jerry Saltz and he kind of has this legitimacy, right? And then another friend of mine, one of her images only got six likes, but there were a couple people who fought for that because they liked the abstract qualities to it. And they thought that it was more authentic because it had so few likes, it was special and uh, kind of unique. I also, and, and you'll notice, um, I give attribution to all of the people who participated in this project, so their Instagram handles were included and signed on the back. Likewise, I did a remix poster for Internet Yamaichi as well, and these, again, were um, sourced from uh, the life that the piece had online. And you'll even see um, various kind of details of people's fingers, or, or uh, on this one on the side, there's a guy who was looking up, the, up at the piece and he had an emoji t-shirt on. And he kind of becomes a part of the fabric of the work. Uh, thanks to Mark, in 2016, he invited me to Spain to participate in his show there, and I got to see the work of art for the first time. What had interested me from the beginning was that it was a work I knew primarily, I'd never seen the original in the Prado, so I only knew it, like emoji, as something, an object of the internet, right? A meme, almost. And so I finally got to see the original in 2016, so I made sure that before I visited the Prado, I had created an augmented reality version of the Garden of Emoji Delights. And I surreptitiously, because no photography is allowed in the Prado, pulled out my cell phone, and this is an augmented version. And I actually, does everybody know what augmented reality is? Okay, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, so I got to hack the Prado, basically. So uh, I used as the um, trigger images for the augments, uh, reproductions of the original image. So here are some other examples you'll see of um, the different augments that I produce, but they all are triggered by the original source material. And let's just play this. And that just gives you an idea. So this is the augmented reality. So taking it into another um, level of reality. And, yeah. I'm going to keep moving. Now, um, something else that's really fascinating to me is digital semiotics and how, you know, these signs and symbols and, you know, uh, particularly something like emoji, how 
uh, it, ha it is still very limited in terms of the lexicon. And that was something else that I was interested in doing when I first created the Garden of Moji Delights in 2013 and then through the year uh, 2014. Um, there was only one skin tone for emoji at that time. And also, particularly because my source material was Bosch, there were all these chimeras, all these fantastical creatures, so I had to create new emoji. I had to kind of expand the lexicon. And it's still very limited. Like right now, we don't have a global you know, warming emoji. We don't have a climate change emoji. We don't have a face for war and, and for desolation emoji, right? And there are interesting people who have, for example, emoji dick, which the entire uh, Moby Dick was translated into emoji but there are limitations still to this particular language. Likewise, the co-optation of you know, Bosch, whether you wanna say it, it's co-opting or just how popular it is and how it has been absorbed by uh, popular culture. So we see t-shirts and boots with uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights. And interesting enough, three years ago, I was Googling myself for the Garden of uh, Moji Delights. Someone contacted me and they wanted an image and it's easier to find it online than on my computer. I have a really messy computer. And I found that somebody was selling a dress of the work. They were actually selling three. And people had left comments like, oh my God, that's such a great idea. And I was like, wait a second, they don't give me any credit and they're selling this and not giving me credit. And it was in China and intellectual property in China is very different than here and there was very little recourse that I could take. It eventually um, kind of disappeared. Maybe they didn't sell enough of them. But uh, this year actually, I decided to kind of take that concept and make it my own. So I made little miniature dresses. It was for a show curated by Greta Lau, an artist in this show called Iconos Iconicity. And so I decided to mash up again these iconic figures and I'm really kind of interested in body modification and what's going on in popular culture and so I took Barbie dolls and then I modeled them in a 3D modeling program and created these new chimera and dressed them in little miniature Garden of Emoji Delight dresses. Um, and then what you see at the bottom also in terms of my practice, uh, my latest series, and these actually took over Times Square last fall, I've been working with another eccentric art historical figure um, and of course, as I'm talking right now, I'm gonna to continue to talk until I think of his name unless somebody else recognizes who his work is. Um, with the fruits and vegetables. Fruit yeah, the... Arch and Baldo. That was a test. I was just trying to see who was good at art history. Yeah. And uh, so I've been using emoji again uh, for these kind of post-human uh, figures. Uh, and another quotation, uh, this is called Origins of the Universe. And um, so I think all of you might be familiar with Courbet and, um, and, and not so much an eccentric art historical figure here, but one who was really shocking to the taste of the time. And this painting can still get people kicked off of Facebook. So here we have an iPhone and it's constantly scraping from the internet. It has uh, seven different search strings for origins of the universe. And so that's constantly playing between her legs. Now, given the popularity of the Garden of Emoji Delights, uh, it seems like generally when I'm contacted, people are like, Garden of Emoji Delights, you're the emoji woman. And uh, so this is a piece that I produced in 2016. And um, this is called the uh, Electronic Graveyard. And you can see in front of my gravestone, which is also uh, an enlarged iPhone, the Garden of Emoji Delights plays in there. And then I'm kind of, my consciousness possibly is being uploaded. And this is my last slide, so I think I'm on time. Uh, also, I have a new alter ego, uh, Carla Gann, and that's uh, c.a.r.l.a.gan, uh, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action generative adversarial network. And you notice in her studio, she uses the Garden of Mochi Delights as her blanket. Uh, these are all the places that you can find me or contact me, and I look forward to talking to you later on. Thank you.